Welcome back everyone. Well, I'm getting a bit of a late start on the day, so this video is going up a little later than usual, but um, went with my wife over to see her new office at her new school where she just got a job as a school counselor, so we're excited for that. Uh, if you have not seen the first two episodes of this reaction series to Genghis Khan from Extra History, there's a link in the description that'll take you to episode one. Also, the link to the original episode three without my commentary. There will be some streams this weekend. I should be announcing those very, very soon. Let's go ahead and dive in. Tragic beginning, a daring escape, and a rise to power. The step has come to life with gossip. Could young upstart Temujin be the one to defy custom and unite the Mongol clans under one ruler? So, yeah, he says young, and the, I think several people commented after yesterday's episode, all the stuff that's already happened in the first two episodes, and he's still, the guy who's going to become Genghis Khan is still just a teenager. He's still just 19 by the time all of this stuff, I mean, he's had a lifetime of stuff happen to him already. And we're so we're picking up the story right around that point, I would guess. Rumors of Temujin's daring escape from Jamaica's band traveled fast across the steppe. Respected prophets and religious leaders began to report that Temujin's ascension to power was destined by the spirits, and Temujin was 100% okay with that. He summoned his followers to participate in a council called a Kurultai, which was essentially an election. Families, lineages, and clans voted by showing up. Their presence served as an endorsement, or their absence as a vote against him. So, I have to think that because he doesn't have the pedigree that other rulers have had. We've talked about that a little bit already, how he kind of doesn't really come from that privileged kind of noble background. Uh, he's making up for that, not only with his own skill and daring and determination, but also this kind of aura that has been built up around him that he's somehow destined for this or that he's anointed by the gods or however they would have seen this, that there's something greater at play here than just what meets the eye. And that's how you, those are the ways that you have to counter not having the pedigree. It's got to be about skill and it's got to be about kind of something bigger that people can't really quantify. Attracting a simple majority counted as a victory. Unfortunately, the turnout was scarce. Ah. The majority of steppe lineages still supported Jamaica. Temujin could work with this, though. Having now gathered all of his allies in one place, he consolidated this small but loyal group to establish himself as a minor Khan. And thus, Temujin became Temujin Khan. He quickly sent an envoy to Ong Khan to reassert his loyalty and seek his patron's blessing, reassuring him that this new title was not meant as a challenge. Unk Khan was fine with it. He preferred that Temujin and Jamaica's ambitions stay focused against each other instead of him. With his patron's blessing secured, Temujin built up a revolutionary system of government within his tribe. So now I'm curious to know whether or not Temujin's plans are to eventually overthrow this benefactor of his. Is he just placating him until he can grow powerful enough to challenge him? Or does he legitimately feel this way? Hey, I'm not. I'm no threat to you. I'm just kind of carving out my own little niche here. I don't really have any greater, you know, kind of aspirations than this. A Khan's court was known as an ordu, or horde, and traditionally the Khan's horde consisted exclusively of his relatives and served as a kind of aristocracy over the rest of the tribe. Temujin, however, assigned positions of power based on loyalty and ability, mm. without regard for familial ties. He appointed butchers, cooks, archers, guards, and keepers of prized herds of livestock and horses. He now, remember, I mean, they talked earlier about how family basically is loyalty, so there's not a lot of difference on the surface anyway. If you are family, you're allies, you're, you're loyal. Uh, but if you don't have that, if you don't have the family that's powerful enough, then you look for another way. This is thinking outside the box. This is looking at the status quo as it exists and recognizing that within the way things function, I can't get where I want to go. So I've got to change how things function. And in doing so, he's getting a lot of people on his side, as we talked about yesterday, uh, because this is an opportunity for people who don't otherwise have those opportunities to get ahead. 
He also created an elite regiment of bodyguards to surround his camp at all times. Jamuka, meanwhile, still refused to acknowledge Temujin as anything other than an insolent upstart who needed to be put in his place. He carefully planned and bided his time, waiting for just the right moment to take Temujin down. That moment finally came a year after Temujin's Kurultai. One of Temujin's followers killed one of Jamaka's distant relatives during a cattle raid, and Jamaka used this as a justification to attack Temujin's camp with his vastly superior army, quickly routing Temujin's forces. Then, to prevent them from regrouping and retaliating, Jamaka perpetrated a horrific show of revenge, beheading one of the captured leaders and boiling 70 captive prisoners alive. Mm. Unfortunately for Jamaka, this cruel show of force backfired hard, horrifying even his staunchest allies. By treating his enemies this way, he further emphasized the divisions between the old aristocratic lineages and the abused lower classes. Temujin may have lost the battle, but this moment was a turning point in terms of public support and sympathy. More families flocked to join Temujin's camp, and he slowly began to rebuild. In 1195, a 33-year-old Temujin would be handed an unexpected opportunity in the form of a foreign raid. A group called the Jurchid approached Ong Khan asking him to raise an army and attack their enemies, the Tartars. For this raid, Ong Khan enlisted Temujin's horde. Now, Temujin had... So, I want to st take a moment and look a little deeper into this group. We're talking about the Tartars. So, the Tartars are often called Tatars, and it's actually a, a common <clears throat> last name that I've seen here in Northeast Ohio. I went to school with people with the last name Tatar. Uh, and it actually it typically comes from Eastern Europe, but there's like about 7 million people today who are part uh, of that ethnic group known as the Tatars or the Tartars. Uh, in uh, 5.3 million just in Russia. The Tsars of Russia uh, had Tatar origins, many of them. Uh, so there's 10,000 in the, in the United States, but primarily Russia and Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan is where you're going to find these folks. Uh, and it goes back to about a thousand years ago is where you're going to see kind of the origins of what we know about this group of people. Uh, and you can kind of see primarily where they come from. The Crimean uh, region, um, a little bit further, kind of Central Asia is basically what we're talking about here. Much to gain from this venture, so he gathered support of his own. He approached a small clan directly to the south of his camp, the Jerkin, and offered them spoils and glory in exchange for participating in the raid. The Jerkin gave their word. They were in. Shortly before the raid, Temujin invited the Jerkin to a feast. Unfortunately, during the celebration, Temujin's half-brother Belgate spotted two Jerkin attempting to steal horses. Oh boy. He identified one of the thieves as a renowned wrestler named Buri, and readied himself to fight the man as an equal, thinking that they would wrestle honorably. Instead, Buri drew his sword and cut Belgate across the shoulder. A grave insult. Oh. When the rest of the feast heard about this, it turned into a drunken brawl. And by brawl, I mostly mean food fight, because in keeping with tradition, everybody had left their weapons behind. Nice. Needless to say, when the time came to set out on a raid against the Tartars, the Jerkin never showed up to help. As with the Kurultai, absence constituted a vote of no confidence in Temujin. Victory was swift and easy all the same, and the spoils were astounding. The Tartars had access to manufactured goods from the Chinese Empire, including silk clothes mm. and blankets and gold and silver jewelry. Captured children wore luxuries the likes of which the ragged Mongols had never seen on anyone, let alone a child. The opulence was astounding. But more importantly, Temujin saw clearly how the powerful Jurchid had just used one border tribe to fight another. And the lesson was clear. A tribe conquered today will rise up and have to be defeated again in an endless cycle of warfare with no decisive victory or lasting peace. Temujin will remember this. So I guess you have two options in that situation. You either get them to ally with you or assimilate with you, or you have to wipe them out. Uh, and I, what little I know of the story of Genghis Khan is that that's kind of the attitude he's going to take toward future peoples, and I get that. With his newfound wealth, Temujin was now prepared to push into the territories of smaller neighboring tribes. When he returned home to discover that the Jerkin had raided his camp while he was away, picking his first target became very easy. Now that he was an experienced, battle-tested commander, Temujin and his mounted archers scattered the Jerkin with ease. 
With this victory in hand, Temujin instituted another revolutionary change in ruling style. See, in the traditional cycle of Mongol raiding and counterattack, the defeated tribe was looted and a few key prisoners were taken, but the rest of the tribe was left alone. Historically, those survivors would then regroup and strike back, yep. or seek out larger rival clans to join. And this is not unique to Central or Eastern Asia or even Western Asia. This is standard practice all over the world, right? You, you have to um, do something to subdue those people. Uh, and often it involves killing the leaders or taking hostage certain people. This happened in Europe a whole lot, uh, where you would take certain leaders hostage uh, that you captured, then you'd ransom them, ransom them back. Or if they were a threat to your power and authority, you executed the people who were the threat. Temujin decided that this cycle was not in his best interests. After defeating the Jerkin, he summoned a Kurultai of all his followers and conducted a public trial of the aristocratic Jerkin leaders. For failing to fulfill their promise of joining him in war, and for raiding his camp in his absence, they were found guilty, and Temujin had them executed. After this, he went on to occupy the Jerkin lands and redistribute them amongst his followers. He then integrated the remaining Jerkin citizens into the households of his own clan. So there's a lot that I see going on here. Number one, he didn't unilaterally make this decision. He included other people. He did kind of a trial, but the main point was that other people expressed their agreement that these guys were to be executed. So it's not just him unilaterally doing that. So it can't all be blamed on him. He also then is justifying it. He's saying, here's what they did, and he's making it public so that people understand, which can then be communicated to other future targets. Uh, and then now he gives an opportunity for those who are remaining, join us, and probably join us or die. Not as slaves, but as full members in good standing. He also adopted an orphaned jerkin boy as his brother, giving him to his mother, Olun, to raise as her own son. Then, as a final show of force, Temujin summoned all of his followers, including the newly adopted Jerkin, to a feast. For the event, he also summoned Bori, the wrestler who had started that great brawl by stealing horses and cutting Belgate. Temujin ordered the two men to wrestle. Bori had never lost a match in his life, but he feared Temujin's wrath and allowed Belgate to throw him. Normally, this would mean that the match was over, but Belgate and Temujin had made their own plans. After winning, Belgate set upon the defeated Buri and broke his back. With this final merciless display, Temujin had rid himself of all the Jerkin leaders and sent a clear message to all who might Man, oppose him. That was if brutal. you surrender to Temujin and remain loyal, there are great rewards to be gained. But if you betray him, there will be no mercy and nobody, not even aristocrats, are safe. Mm. Temujin moved his base of operations into Jerkin territory, continuing to conquer and attract lesser lineages. And I should mention here, too, I don't know how much they'll get into this, but, you know, we've been talking a lot about how earlier in his life, things like his mother had been taken off in captivity and, and forced into a relationship with her captors and, uh, you know, about um, people being raped and, and, you know, having children and things like that, and, uh, including his own wife. And uh, it is important to point out that Genghis Khan, Temujin, did the exact same things to conquered peoples. He had many, many wives and concubines, often from groups that he had uh, conquered. Um, same kinds of things happen. So this, this, he wasn't a helpless victim. It was something he also did to other people. Meanwhile, Jamaka worked to establish himself as a leader and advocate for the aristocrats, who feared the threat Temujin posed to their traditions and way of life. Then, in 1201, once he had the full support of the aristocracy, Jemuka made a play for the title of ruler of all Mongols. He summoned his own Kurultai and successfully bestowed upon himself the title of Gur Khan, an ancient and revered title which meant universal ruler. Mm. This was a strategic choice. Jamaka chose this title not just because it was ancient and respected, but also because the last person to bear the title was Ong Khan's uncle, who had ruled until Ong Khan revolted and killed him. Jamaka was not just challenging Temujin here, but Ong Khan as well. Yep. If he could win this war, he would be the supreme ruler of the Central Steppe. So he's got to be pretty confident that he's got the power to be able to win against the combined forces of these two guys. 
uh, or else he's not going to declare himself with a title like that that's going to be that provo provocative and invite the the wrath of these men. As Temujin's patron, Ung Khan came out personally to lead his warriors in the campaign against their rival. The battle was as much psychological as it was physical. Shamans lined the rocky cliffs along the battlefield, beating ritual drums mm. to summon supporting spirits and control That's the awesome. weather. As they beat their drums, a massive thunderstorm gathered, which both sides attributed to the shamans supporting Temujin. This shook the resolve of many of Jemaka's warriors, and caused many to desert in fear of angering the spirits. Jemaka was forced to retreat. Ong Khan chased after Jamaka and the main part of his army, while Temujin gave chase to the Taichut, one of the clans loyal to Jamaka, and coincidentally, the clan that had abandoned him and his family decades before. So again, here we go with that whole kind of the je ne sais quoi, the, that thing you can't really uh, account for in a tangible way, the, the idea that the gods are with him or that the spirits are with him. Uh, you can have all the might in the world, but if psychologically you're thinking we can't beat this guy or God's on his side, that's tough to get around. They proved difficult to defeat. Both sides fought for hours, firing from horseback, from fixed positions behind rocks or hastily assembled barricades. Toward the end of the day, a poisoned enemy arrow struck Temujin Khan's neck, knocking him unconscious. Darkness fell, and both sides made camp on the battlefield to rest until daylight. All right, so I'm just going to try and predict what I think is going to happen here without actually knowing. Obviously, he survives the poisoned arrow, but to me, that's just going to feed into the myth a little bit more, right? Man, he took a poisoned arrow to the neck and survived. The gods, the spirits, whatever they may be, they really are with this guy. We need to be cautious of this. Thanks to the aid of his loyal second-in-command, Temujin recovered by the next morning. The Taichut didn't even know that Temujin had been injured, and most of them had fled uh. in the night. Temujin sent his warriors in pursuit, and as with the Jerkin, publicly executed their leaders and integrated the rest, taking over their lands. He also found the family who had helped him escape 30 years prior, and freed them from their servitude. Tem I like that he remembers those things. Uh, even years later, and honors that and rewards that. Temujin had won this fight, but Jamaka escaped Ong Khan and fled to more remote parts of the steppe to regroup and recruit new allies. Even without the Taichut, Jamaka still had many clans loyal to him. The final showdown was yet to come. So this is a number of years later now, so we've covered a lot of time period at this point. Uh, in fact, let me double check and see exactly what time periods we're talking about here. So we're guessing he's born between 1162 and, and uh, maybe 1167. Um, and it looks like this fight that we were just talking about is, ta is happening 1205. So by this point, he's in his 40s. Um, when this war goes down. So about 20 years have passed from at the end of the last episode when he was just 19 to when all of this other stuff goes down now in the beginning of the 13th century. So so there you have that. And uh, we've still got, we're only halfway through the story. We've got three more episodes to go. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Add to the conversation. Let me know something you learned you didn't know. Hit that like button if you would, please. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.